This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development, providing graduate level education to working professionals online, on campus, and on site. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mohammed Dawood. I'm one of the TAs for this class. Just quick logistics uh, about the class. Uh, attendance is required uh, for all the lectures. Uh, if you, you will find the sign-up sheets um, uh, at the back after, toward the end of the class. Uh, if you miss a class or if you are an CPD student, you have to write two paragraph, one or two paragraph summary of the class and submit them uh, to, the, to the coursework. You find the discussion section on coursework, you uh, select the lecture and submit the, uh, the summary. Um, so Nick, uh, quick announcement about next week. Uh, we have um, Mr. Uh, Howard Marks, he's the chairman of Oak Tree, Oak Tree Capital Management. He would like uh, to tailor the talk to your interest. So he asks if you uh, ask questions and then we'll, uh, we'll give it to him uh, so he can be prepared for the talk. Now I'll uh, turn the microphone to my colleague Sumek Raha, who is going to introduce the speaker. Hi, folks. Uh, today we have a very special speaker, Professor Steven Snyder. And um, so, he, so his official biography is very long and impressive. And I'm just going to summarize it to one line, saying that he's a very famous climatologist. But that's not why he's here today. He has used his background in Bayesian decision analysis to, to fight his own cancer. And what he has left for all of us is this book, The Patient from Hell. And, and after reading this book, I, I was amazed. I mean, this, this is an intense journey of, uh, of a very rare form of ca cancer. And not just about courage, but also about keeping a cool head and making the best decisions we can. We can. And, and this is quite a different paradigm of uh, the patient-doctor relationship. In fact, it's hopefully the start of, uh, of an emphasis on the patient as a decision maker. So tools like decision analysis have existed for a while now, but it's very rare to see uh, a patient who has used this in the, the, the form of thinking that we teach in some of the decision analysis classes at Stanford for their own personal treatment. On that note, uh, just before the talk begins, may I request that we turn off our cell phones. <laughs> and with that, I will pass it to Professor Schneider. So this will be an interactive talk. Hopefully, he will ask you for questions. Please don't hesitate. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, glad to be here. We'll uh, have a lot to cover, so I'm going to go quickly. It's not going to be like next week, where you talk and then they do that. There's a certain amount I want to cover, but we can stop along the way if we need to but we get a little time pressed because I was one of these guys running around the planet working on my day job, you know, how do we deal with climate change and the, the fact that uh, six billion humans use the atmosphere as a free sewer to dump our tailpipe and our smokestack waste and our deforestation products. And that's hard enough problem, then all of a sudden in the middle of this I start getting uh, bad signs from my body. So that it took a lot of treatment and what was the great shock was discovering that a lot of the principles that we were talking about in dealing with climate were actually very similar in dealing with a rare cancer. Uh, for example, uh, if you want to predict uh, how much it's going to warm up in 2050, uh, what data do you use? How much data is there in the future? Zero. There is no frequency, no clinical trial, no standard science, no objective statistics. What you do is you use objective statistics and frequencies to construct a model of how you think the atmosphere works, the oceans work, the ecosystems. You have a model of demography to project how many people in the world. You have a model of economics to, to, to guess what the standard of living is. That means the GDP per capita. Then you have a technology model, which has to figure out how do you translate that GDP per capita and the learning curves 
from energy into emissions? Are we going to use all the cheap available coal and not charge anybody for dumping in the atmosphere? Or will it be strong planetary rules and we'll spend more money in order to have safer systems? All of those involve system scientific projections, none of which can be validated before the fact. What you do then is you construct a process model. You use the process model as your virtual reality, your partly cloudy crystal ball, and as much data as you can get to try to determine the relative credibility of each of the elements in the model. How much are they based upon sound principles? How much have they been validated on similar kinds of experiments? And what you end up with is a subjective group judgment. It's an expert judgment, but it's subjective about the relative quality of the tools. And therefore, when you talk about a consensus in the future, you're not talking about a consensus on a conclusion. You're talking about a consensus on the confidence that you have in the conclusion based on the quality of the tools you use. Unfortunately, this is true in medical diagnostics projecting, particularly for diseases that don't have much data. It's true in almost every business forecast you could make. It's true in military planning. How do you deal with education? Any complicated system will have a mix of data to derive structure, and then you'll be using structure to make projections. And how good that structure is, is where all the fights are. And that's, in fact, what science is. Uh, modeling's easy. Modeling is the logical consequences of explicit assumptions, and that's important. The science is how good are the assumptions and how do you do that. So there's the preface to what I want to try to talk about today. I'll take you very fast through some of the climate issues to set it up and then we'll go quickly into what I had to do with the cancer. So if you want to find out you know, what might happen in the future, you better know what happened in the past. So there's a glacier in, in Patagonia in 1928 and the world is now something like uh, uh, six tenths of a degree warmer than it was uh, in the beginning of the century and about eight tenths a century and a half ago. So you know the glacier will have melted back. And of course, there it is. That proves absolutely nothing. It's one of hundreds and hundreds of glaciers. You can't cherry pick individual glaciers. Believe me, there are people who do that. There are people who want you to think we're going to hell in a handbasket, who pick the worst one, and there are people who are defending the fossil fuel industry, who pick one that didn't melt, and insist that until that melts, we've disproved the rule, which is absolute nonsense, because we deal with preponderance of evidence and systems analysis. All of that is part of, of the climate debate, and to some extent, also in medical. Okay, so here's the most recent uh, 120 years of warming. IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that's the 450 scientists who get together and spend two or three years with two rounds of review writing reports. And if you read the newspapers, we actually do make some mistakes. Uh, so far, they found three out of a thousand conclusions. Uh, how this does translate, it translates in some blogs into you can't trust them when there is no other human endeavor that gets anywhere near a 99% batting average. But in any case, it said this is unequivocal. I didn't like the word. I would have preferred it exceptionally unlikely. I can probably imagine a one in 10,000 scenario where that's wrong. But OK, everything lines up the thermometers, rising sea levels, melting glaciers, plants blooming earlier. But this is what's interesting. Congressman told me last year when I testified I just falsified global warming. Falsification means find an exception to disprove the rule. I tried to explain to him that we are not doing test tube science. We are not doing controlled experiments where you can. Acid or base? What do you guys? I think it's an acid, but I don't know what it is. Oh, it's an herbal. Maybe you're right. But I'm not good enough. So I put in the litmus paper I can falsify a hypothesis. But when we're talking about the future where there's multiple convergent lines of evidence, you don't even know if the data has been collected right. You can't falsify. One exception disproves nothing. Uh, ten uh, uh, forecasts in the right direction don't prove it either. What you do in systems analysis is you break the problem into well-established parts like that, parts with competing explanations where you've got it down to two or three leading candidates. I'll show you that. And speculative. So you find the deep ecology groups get the worst case well-established. Aha, we're going to 
lead to the extinction of the polar bear, which we probably aren't, by the way, but um, the polar bear ecosystem for certain, but the bear, I don't know. And then you say, we got to do something. Then you get somebody from an enterprise institute, carbon dioxide is fertilizer of green plants, it's good for you. Well, yes, individual green plants do grow better in CO2, but when you put them in an ecosystem, the ones that get advantage actually crowd out the other ones, so they're actually altering the ecosystem. Weeds get fertilized, and oh, by the way, it acidifies the oceans, which is dangerous to the food chain at the bottom, and you can be certain that the advocates of CO2 is good for you, forget to tell you the other two. So you end up with this whole cacophony out there of selected inattention to inconvenient information. Everybody does it. It's what I call courtroom epistemology. It's not my job to make my opponent's case. That's what you do in trials. Now, before any of you be too judgmental, if you were ever accused of anything, I don't think you want your lawyer dwelling on abstractions of truth. You want them to get you off. I'm not making a moral judgment, but it's a horrible way to learn. Because in science, deliberately selecting inappropriate bits because it's convenient to a position is generally viewed as unethical by most scientists. It is the only thing that's ethical in dealing in an advocacy system, so, assuming you're not lying, because it's a whole different game with a different purpose. Where it becomes difficult is when you get out there in the real world and people think that because a trial has guilt and innocence, that global warming is or isn't. Well, it's not the way it is. We don't have yes or no. We have multiple outcomes. We have different probabilities attached to those outcomes. That's the Bayesian part. So with that background, let me race through, give you some examples, and hopefully I'll have a little time to talk about it at the end. Did the congressman falsify it because it was as warm in 98 as it is now? Of course not. And the reason for that, as I tried to explain to him, is he cherry-picked the endpoints. If I went from 1992 and I cherry-picked to 2002, we were going to hell in a handbasket. It's well known that the natural variability and interdecadal variability is a couple of tenths of a degree, about as large as the you know, trend you get from human activities. So you have to average over a couple of decades, and then the trend is, as IPCC said, unequivocal. So this is, again, part of why we have to have a literacy about how science works, and we have to be numerate to be able to understand these arguments. Unfortunately, it's occurring at a time that the media have fired almost all their science environment and medical specialists, and they're having general assignment reporters cover it. They don't understand the complexities, so they give equal status at the bargaining table to all claimants of truth, leading to mass confusion, which is unfortunately where we are in the climate problem now. In fact, Senator Inhofe from Oklahoma we just, we were laughing out loud when he had his grandchildren build an igloo in the uh, snow in Washington that occurred uh, and called it Al Gore's Global Warming House. I called it, uh, he brought his grandchildren there. This is scientific child abuse. <laughs> but in any case, it was completely irrelevant, meant absolutely nothing. And the fact that it occurred in January, which was the warmest January in, in recorded history, also means nothing because it's one month. And this kind of frustrates us. All the junk going on out there in the media and the political world that has absolutely nothing to do with system science, yet it gets covered because it's titillating, it's fun for ratings, and it's complete crap, generally spoken by people who, in the case of the senator, are right up there in the top three for getting fossil fuel um, uh, money for running his election campaign. But I like that, slush for brains, it's about right. And this was an old one, information and disinformation, misinformation. People seem to be drawn to us. Don't have any problem finding volunteers on this booth. Okay, I call this in my, uh, in my book, um, I have to give you a shameless self-promotion. I have a book out called Science as a Contact Sport. And uh, it's a 39-year history of failure. Why did we not get the job done when we knew 35 years ago that you can't dump... Uh, uh, stuff in the atmosphere that raises one or two watts of energy over every square meter and have nothing happen. We didn't know whether what was going to happen was real mild or really large. In fact, in the first three years, we didn't know if it was going to warm or cool. It took us three or four years to even sort that out because dust and smoke cools by reflecting sunlight. Greenhouse gases trap heat. It took us till about 74 to figure that one out. But uh, all of that's explained in the book. And um, 
the point of it is uh, it's what I call meteorology. Okay, well, one of the issues that's really important, whether we're talking about cancer uh, or whether we're talking about climate, is uh, what about nonlinear events? This, you know, my favorite group of protesters against global warming, right? They, these guys don't like it. So what's their tipping point? Freezing? Zero? Snow melts. Is that true? Come on, you engineers who've done it, right? Not necessarily. You can melt snow below freezing if the sun's strong. So you have to do an energy budget. Even the simplest thing you could think of, oh, freezing to melt ice isn't strictly true. When you're dealing in system science, you have to do a whole analysis. You have to look at all the various elements, put it together. This is not very amenable for a media story. And this is part of the problem that we have trying to communicate this complexity. It's also true with some diseases. There are many doctors and they have data to show that when you overcomplicate the information that you give a patient with a dread disease, it does not improve their outcome. They need confidence and faith. I happen to be one of those people who I have no confidence and faith if you don't tell me everything. But that's not common. So there are very difficult decisions made sort of the same way. How much information do people need? And what I'm going to argue at the end is, if the person isn't ready because of their in a dread situation, they have family, they have advocates. There are other ways that you can communicate the information and try to make best decisions. OK, so we're about to go there. I promised you competing explanations. Greenland is melting faster than anybody forecast. None of the models predicted this. It's only 10 years. Actually, it's now closer to 20. But that's about the time of natural variability in the North Atlantic that's very large. Competing explanation one, it's just a natural cycle. Competing explanation two, no, it's global warming. Well, how do you sort it out? Well, the way they sort it out is by actually sinking cores in the glacier, looking to see if it's melted before in the last thousand years. It hasn't up on the top. Therefore, it's more likely than not, I'm not ready to go to very likely yet, but more likely than not, say, a preponderance of evidence in a civil trial, that global warming is driving it. But why couldn't it be both in differing amounts? In order to, to sort that out, you've got to do complex system theory. You have to use data that is not direct. The only direct way to validate this is to hang around 100 years. Now you're performing the experiment on a laboratory called Earth, which is not always a smart idea when you're talking about a tipping point. That means something that lasts indelibly for five meters of sea level rise. So what do we do in science, right? Risk. Can anybody define it? What's risk? What can happen, of course? Multiplied times what? Probability. Exactly. So probability matters. How do you do probability when there's no baseline? Or that you have, right? There's no baseline in the future. So what you do is you construct those models, you have discussions among groups, and you try to infer subjective probabilities. Or you do something surrogate. So you cannot get a direct probability of this, but by putting pipes in there, and the probability that it's not melted before is one, that then revises your prior belief. That's what a Bayesian is. So you start out with a, what, right? What do they call it? Any, any Bayesians here? You have a prior belief, which is all the knowledge you have leading you to a conclusion of your best understanding. Now you get something new, like you go out there and you find out it hasn't melted before. It's not a direct test, but it's a direct test of a process that matters. And that has to revise your priority, your probability. And then you have what's called an a posteriori or a Bayesian prior. And that, for me, is higher probability that humans are doing it because they never found any previous melt. So that's how the system works. It's not as satisfying as frequency statistics or putting the litmus paper in here. We sure wish we could do that. And in my disease, I would have loved to have a clinical trial, but they didn't. And I'm getting to that now because there were some doctors who said, no clinical trial, no out-of-the-box treatment. I said, no out-of-the-box treatment, I'm dead, no way. We're using Bayesian analysis, and I realized they didn't know what I was talking about. That's most of the rest of the story. So what have we got? In climate, uncertainty in the projections in the future. I told you how many people, what standards of living and all that. So you start out with the best guess. Economists like to do that. 
Now we know that's terrible. You have to use a range. That's not even good. We do PDFs. You all know what PDFs are, right? These things? No, 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 not those things. <laughs> it's this thing, probability density function, and this is what you do. So you have a 10% chance we're pretty lucky, less than a degree. 10% chance we get an ice age interglacial cycle difference, catastrophic outcomes. And what you're really looking at is a wheel of fortune for the life support system of the Earth. So I said risk is what can happen and what are the odds. There we are. There are the odds. There's what can happen, the numbers. So what do you do about that? That's risk management. Risk is objective scientific operation. Even if you're talking about the future where it's subjective, at least it's expert. But when it comes to is it worth spending current resources we could use on poverty or health or clean water on dealing with climate, then you're now talking about a value judgment about balancing resources in a limited framework. Well, if we don't do that and we end up on this part, we'll have catastrophic outcomes. So the job becomes making the less bad slots fatter and the really bad slots skinnier. How much you invest relative to all the other callings in society, that's going to depend upon risk management, which is the political value judgment. There is no calculus inside of economics that can give you the answer, because how do you weigh the inequity to poor people who are hurt more by climate change in hot countries than rich people who generated more of the problem? That's not dollarizable and discountable by any simple metric. Um, or the fact that the shipping industry benefits from melting the Arctic because the ships can have a shorter route versus the destruction of the Inuit hunting culture of the polar bear ecosystem. I don't know. I'm not going to use a travel method. It's just a joke. I mean, so the point is that you're going to end up with a political decision about the relative importance of these things. Now, once that political decision is had, we need the economists desperately because you don't want to waste money. We want to achieve that goal as cost effectively as possible. And that is true not just in climate. It's also true in treatment. So when I got an outside the box treatment that was a little bit more expensive than the standard treatment, but the fact that I didn't have to be retreated has actually saved them money. But they didn't know that in advance. So let me get there. Okay, so of course, climate policy is risk management. So is that. So let's put it together now. So we have climate and I'm going to move to cancer. High consequences, no doubt. Long-term outcomes, if you're dead, that's a long-term outcome. Inherent uncertainties, I had a rare cancer, and even people who don't have rare, supposing you know the bell curve perfectly of a cancer that somebody has, how do you know where you are in the bell curve? So you haven't individualized it to you. So there is still uncertainty. Perfect knowledge of a probability distribution does not give you perfect knowledge of your outcome. So you have to deal with that too. And in my case, insufficient frequency data, both for climate and my cancer. And you cannot simply do it with data. It will require process knowledge and modeling at the same time. So there's the commonalities. All right. This was very important in climate. And it's very important in cancer. Anybody know type 1, type 2 error? Supposing you're an earthquake forecaster. You predict a 20% chance based on your 20 years of hiding work that you've been doing because you're afraid somebody might hear you, that there's going to be a major earthquake in LA next weekend. So what happens if you announce it? There'll be a mass exodus. Hundreds of people will be killed in accidents. Thousands will stay behind to be loot, looted, to loot and be shot. It will be a very high consequence. I better shut up. That's what we call type 1 error. Suppose it false positive. Supposing the forecast is wrong, squandered resources, you're responsible. Wow, be quiet. Scientists love not to say anything when they're not confident, for obvious reasons. Supposing you're right, nobody and everybody left. Well, still going to get a couple hundred people killed, but not 20,000. Good move. What about the type 2 error? So let's say that uh, it's too risky. Too much uncertainty. Let's not do it. Proves false. Good thing. Proves true. Oh my God, we got hit without help. There is no correct answer to this. It's a value judgment. It's a value judgment about whether you're risk prone or risk averse. There's no such thing as right. So when my colleagues in IPCC said, 
They didn't know how much sea level rise there'd be because the rate at which Greenland is melting means that we haven't got a basis for predicting it. What they did was made an implicit type 1 error aversion, which is policy prescriptive and therefore not acceptable. I was in a massive fight with them and said, you are unconscious and you're not mean or evil people, but you made a policy prescription. It is society's job to decide whether or not an unknown probability of a consequential outcome deserves resources to slow it down. That's risk management. Same thing in treating cancer. So you will find false negative, false positive, a large fraction. And your job in decision analysis is not to pretend that there's a right answer, but to separate out the components of the argument that are objective and then involve making judgments from the components of the argument that are judgment. Uh, and you can do that, so at least you're arguing about the right stuff. Are you arguing risk? What can happen? What are the odds? Well, we can use science. Or are you arguing risk management? We are talking about how you want to react. If we could just get those separated, then at least we have a basis for a more rational discussion. Okay. S role of scientists, assess risk. I've told you this already. Consequence times probability. And you do that as a function of alternative policies, low, medium, and high emissions. The confidence, remember I told you that also, in the assessment of risk is critical. If you have very high confidence, you're going to be more concerned than low confidence. Who wins and who loses matters, and can you trace all your aggregations? And what's the job for decision makers and the public? What's acceptable? Acceptability is a value judgment. That's the public's job. That's what a democracy is supposed to do. And they make policy choices, and they also tell us what we study, because they're funding it. So there's the separation. So now back to patient from hell, and let me go fast through that. There's my Dr. Sandra Horning, who really had never run into a character like uh, us before. My wife, Terry Root, is a real biologist. I'm a climatologist who's a pretend biologist in a biology department. My job is to connect my colleagues and students to the larger scale biogeochemical climate stuff. So we came in one day with a little decision analytic flowchart, which Terry drew. So the amount of cancer in the bone marrow when I began was 40%. They didn't even tell me that. They thought I didn't need to know. Well, I guess I didn't need to know. It just gave me more impetus. So we do one to four chemotherapies. Then they do a biopsy. If there's less than X percent cancer, then what? Do you do six? Or do you do what we called maintenance therapy? They told me my cancer was almost impossible to get rid of. That you could drive it down, but that it creep back. So I said, okay, cancer can't kill me. A trillion cells can kill me. So why don't we just repeatedly knock it back? So it'll go up, we knock it back. Go and the answer was, we don't have a clinical trial. I said, you don't need a clinical trial. It's process knowledge. But we don't do any treatments without clinical trials. I said, that's mantra. That's paradigm. That's not science. Oh, but it's, it's, and they kept telling me that this science was uh, uh, the gold standard. I said, no, no, my social science friends would call that prejudicial labeling. It is not a gold standard. It is one standard. Would I want the data? Of course. And I'll show you the arguments that we used. Anyhow, uh, do we do other tests? BMT is bone marrow transplant, which I did. Auto means I got my own stem cells back. Aloe would have meant I had somebody else's. That is a cure. Too bad it's a 30% chance the cure will kill you. I wasn't willing to make a 30% risk. That was not a doctor decision. That was my decision. Because they should not decide for you how to do that. That's got to be you, your advocates, and your family's decision. I was willing to risk a relapse because I thought that we had another alternative called maintenance therapy, which didn't exist though it existed in principle. Everybody understood exactly what we said when we talked about it. What about a vaccine that was being developed? So we went through this flow chart. We had to get, remember, what are, what are, what are boxes? Stocks. What are arrows? Flows. Got any probabilities. So how do you get a probability of all this stuff? We said, OK, you docs, you tell us. It's what I call the 100 patients like me. There are 100 patients like me. If I do the full bone marrow transplant, I get into what they call complete remission, meaning you can't detect it in a CT scan. That means you, have money, you could have many more than a million cells, but as long as they're not agglomerated into a little lump, you'll never see it. And they'll grow back 
cloning once a month till two years from now you get full-blown cancer back. I didn't want that outcome because that was by far the most likely outcome. So I said, there are 100 patients like me. How many are going to be in remission after this treatment? They said, maybe 80. Uh, okay, um, in five years, how many are still going to be in remission? They said, maybe 20. If I asked them now, they'd say maybe two because they didn't have, know much about the disease. I said, okay, you take the, um, the 80 patients who've lost their remission. Uh, you got 100 of them. You give them high-dose chemotherapy, radiation, all the dangerous stuff, all those bad, nasty, horrible treatments that the book describes. How many can get back? And they said, half. I said, so let me see. I got an 80% chance I'm going to lose it, and I've got a 50% chance you can get it back. I got a 40% chance I'm a dead man in less than five years. Oh, we never said that. <laughs> what do you mean you never said that? Well, it's not good for you to think like that. I don't want your mantra. That's your numbers. Do you want to take them back? Well, you know we don't know these numbers that well. I said, I know, but, and I meant every word of this. I trust my life to your intuition about cancer. They're the best in the world. You can't do better than that. So I want to know what they think. I didn't say I didn't trust anything to their decision analytic skills, because that's not how they're trained. They're not trained to do what I'm talking about now, which is constructing what we call a regret matrix. So my regret for following their procedure was 40% chance of being dead. I said, all right, supposing we did a maintenance therapy and we used a monoclonal antibody, which is a protein that attaches to a site on a B cell. I have a B cell cancer. Terry and my philosophy was very simple. If I don't have B cells, how can I have cancer? So if you're going to attach this protein, which is synthesized, made by Genentech, invented, in fact, by my doc's husband and one of her colleagues, brilliant people, and if it, it comes as close to a miracle drug as anything there is for this kind of a disease, how does it work? Well, when it attaches to that receptor site in a B cell, now the B cell is no longer you. It's you plus some modification. And your own killers, your own T cells, your own immune system says enemy. So your own immune system takes it out instead of these heavy drugs, which scour out everybody. You hear my voice? That's a little bit of residual lung problem from the high dose radiation that I had even eight years later. So, you know, you, you can't save your life completely for free. There are side effects. But if it means a cup of tea to talk to you guys, it's not exactly a bad side effect. Okay, so we went through all of that, and I said they take 100 patients off the street and you give them maintenance therapy. How many would you kill? They said, this is outrageous. This is violates every principle of medical ethics. I said, meaning what? Do no harm. And I said, I don't want to hear your paradigm. How many would you kill? Now, the young doc said, we don't know. We have no clinical trial. The older doc said, come on, we've used this drug 50 times just in the last month. Nobody. Maybe one anaphylactic, you know, dangerous allergy, but we do it in the hospital with all the equipment we need just in case. So I said, let me give you one. How many times do your synapses have to fire to trade a 40% chance of being dead in that regret matrix versus a 1%? We're doing maintenance therapy. And they said, no, you're not, because there's no clinical trial. And so we went in a circle. So let me finish it up by showing you how I won that one. Okay, do nothing but monitor after the first treatment. Probability of losing emission. I went through these numbers. These are their numbers. And today they'd probably be even more pessimistic. So 40%, you already said that, right? Uh, what did I do, hit the wrong button? Yeah. Okay, so we do rituxan, that's the drug, the monoclonal antibody. Less than 40, they agreed. So what do you do? I said, you use decision analysis. What I gave you is what, first week? Just sit there and calculate out regret matrix. And, uh, and it's precaution. OK, so this is what drove me nuts. You're not, I promise you, you will not have to read this. They told me, one of the, one of the fellows, that there was a clinical trial, and it showed that the long-term use of monoclonal antibody does not work. And this is in a refereed journal in the American Society of Clinical Oncology, which, in fact, Sandra Horning, my doctor, was president of. She's not responsible for what goes in the journals before that. And so what they did is they gave people two kinds of drugs, one with the monoclonal antibody, one without, same treatment I had. And it turned out 
that they had very similar what they call PFS progression free survival in the beginning 16 months versus remission versus 18 so their conclusion was it helps you in the beginning and it's a transiently clear but that it does not help you in the end there's no evidence that it works in the end and therefore I was told maintenance therapy doesn't work Favorable clinical and molecular response rates do not translate into prolonged progression-free survival in mantle cell lymphoma. Full stop, flat statement, refereed medical journal. Nevertheless, the combination made transiently. I got so mad, I said, I'm beginning to think medical science is an oxymoron. I said, this experiment does not do maintenance therapy. This experiment has nothing to do with maintenance therapy. Do you know what systems analysis is? another blank. So that's what we did next. Learn systems analysis. And I have a mega good doc. By this time she's already very interested. Oh, let's do that. So we went to meetings afterward. We talked about all this stuff. I mean, this is what happens when you get somebody with an open mind. It's really helpful. So we did the 29th day. You know the parable? So there's a lily pond and the lilies double every day. And on the 30th day, it covers the whole pond. So when is the uh, pond half covered? 29th. That seems counterintuitive. It's just how exponentials work. OK, so let's assume we did this experiment to show them. Post-transplant. I've had my transplant. I'm in complete remission. OK. I've got 1,000 cells floating in my body when we use the monoclonal antibody. Never detect it. If we didn't use it, remember it said it works transiently? We have 100,000. Pulled the numbers out of my left ear. It could be a million and 10 million. Whatever it is, it's well below detectable. And the data is very clear since most people get their, their cancer back that you've got residual cells that clone. And they typically think it's about a month to clone. So after transplant, how many cell doublings does it take to lose remission? So I guessed if we have a trillion cells in our body, how about a tenth of that? And we'll call that takes up your marrow, can't produce any more immune stuff, you're dead, which is the direction I was heading. All right. So if you start out with 1,000 cells or 100,000 cells and you double every month, what happens? 26 months or 20 months for that. It's almost exactly the same as the result of that so-called clinical trial. All they were doing was telling you that exponential growth swamps initial size. And they were saying it was maintenance therapy. It wasn't maintenance therapy. It was bad science. And uh, I was, at one stage I got mad enough when they said, but that's, that's, that's what the, our journals say. I said, you know, with all due respect to Roberta Flack, remember her, what, her song? Right, killing me softly with, 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 with song. I said, I'm not going to have you killing me slowly with your paradigm. And so we drew for them how exponentials work, you know, and how these things go, and why they could have a few months difference when there's a large initial condition. But what's the key? The key is Keep it in the th business. So why am I showing you Patagonia, other than I like Patagonia? Because walking out there was this guy, a fox. And there nearby was the rabbits. And of course, what a fox is going to do, they're going to eat rabbits. And we all know that the rabbits go out of control when the foxes are out of the system. So if you use an analogy, and the rabbits are the cancer, the foxes are your healthy cells, and something goes wrong, and they're out of the system, the rabbits go bonkers and they take it over. So now we have to get smart. We have to fix it. We need chemotherapy. So the eco-oncologists come to the rescue. A new species of fox, chemo and monoclonal antibody. We control them. And does it work? Well, you're going to get rid of most of them. But rabbits hide in holes. You can't get rid of them all. So how are you going to keep the numbers of rabbits down so they don't destroy the neighborhood? Don't take the foxes out. So by stopping the treatment, as in that first trial, they took the foxes out. Of course it grew back. Leave it in. Maintenance therapy. That's what decision analysis can help you to do 
in making these decisions. So they hold it down. So keep them in the system after the treatment. And yes, Sandra Horning is a very smart woman, very honest person. And we tried it, and it worked. <laughs> I'm still here, eight and a half years post bone marrow transplant. Okay, now there have been some tests, and they're beginning to find out that it actually is working. It's being used all over now. Uh, it took quite a while, and the main resistance was paradigmatic. But if we don't have a clinical trial, meaning we're not frequency statisticians, we're not doing real science. And what I tried to tell them is frequency statistics and the tyranny of the null hypothesis and p-scores and all that stuff are fine, happy, necessary pieces of science, but they are not the answer. They're a piece of a judgment that also has to have process knowledge. Does it make sense? How does it work under different conditions? And that good scientists are doing system science under multiple components of information. All right. I will, let me skip that. You don't need to know that. Okay. So let me end. How does a clinical trial work? It's outcome-based. How many are still standing at the end of 10 years? Well, you know, some things we can't anticipate, so let's go. I like it. I wish they had the data for me. I, I'm not in the slightest hostile to clinical trials or frequency statistics. I'm hostile to their sole use. That's my problem. Now, when they told me that they would learn nothing from my case, I said, that's not true. They said, well, you're an N of 1. And nobody does science in an N of 1. I said, so what about those of us in the Earth sciences? We got one patient. We got Ma Earth, so we're just stupid. What do we do? Every time a volcano blows up, we measure the dust. We measure the cooling. We use that to calibrate our models. We look back at ice ages and interglacial cycles. We look at the seasons. We look at El Ninos. We use alternative gifts that nature gives us, which are not precisely CO2 doubling, but our energy changes to the system, and we use those as surrogates to calibrate components of the process model so that we can change our subjective confidence in how well the model works. And I said, let's just do that you know, with, with, with cancer, too. So I, I gave them an example. All right, the Martians. Very neutral, right? So the Martians are the solar system's best cancer docs. And they take pity on you, and they come down and tell you for the 500 leading cancers and the 3,000 leading drugs, which cocktail works best? What are you going to do? The doc said, give the cocktail that works best. Of course. What do you mean? I said, well, to which patient? And they said, cancer patients. <laughs> and I said, wait, which cancer patient? Now they said, all right, what's your point? I said, all the Martians gave you was median. They may even have given you the bell curve. Did they tell you where any patient is on that bell curve? If you're in the first sigma, you're overdrugging them. If you're in the third sigma, you're underdrugging them. You need to individualize testing and diagnostics to see where they are so that you're adjusting your drug dose to fit the individuals. So it's not that you don't want the frequencies, but you also want to have an additional diagnostic when possible. In my case, it's called PCR, polymerase chain reaction. We are actually monitor my blood for my very specific tumor. That's how we know that I'm in complete remission, because we test it. So that's the question. So you need both. The other one I used, and I said, you guys already do it. And I said, you're Bayesians. They said, no, we're not. No, we're clinical trialists. I said, OK, tomorrow, somebody walks in here who's on, on drugs that gives them immuno weakness. What are you going to do? They're shaking chills and fever. Well, we're obviously going to listen to the lungs. They probably have pneumonia. It's common. And I said, OK, right. Why don't you go to the web, see what the average fever is on the second day of a fever, Look what drug works best on average. Send them home and be outcome-based and see if they're still alive in a month. That's a clinical trial. Of course we wouldn't do that. I said, right, what are you going to do? We're going to do a sputum sample. We're going to check the temperature every four hours. I said, you're Bayesians. You're doing the right thing. You're wonderful doctors. You're using data that fits the individual patient. And then you're going to adjust the treatment to fit them. Of course you've got the data. I'm, do that for cancer. And I got looked at. But it's different. Why is it different? It's different only because you've made it different. And so that's what we were able to, to try to accomplish. And with some success, 
So it's not clinical trials versus process knowledge or frequency. That's a stupid framing. It's use all the information you have in the best context you have and combine it. When it isn't direct frequencies, look at the processes. And then you make that expert subjective judgment about the relative likelihood. So that's really the basic story I wanted to tell you. Doctor-patient dialogues needed, decision analytics, principles, companion to trials. I, now may, I don't have to advertise this anymore. That's now done. Open mind, not paradigmatic thinking. Practicing decision analysis in medical situations. It's already practiced in military situations. Rand Corporation, and I'm glad they're doing it, runs a thousand forced posture scenarios of low probability so that should one of those weird things happen, at least they thought about it. And you do that in business. I mean, every venture capitalist has, does decision analysis to split their portfolio into risky, not so risky, you know, and, uh, and, and, ver and very non-risky, each one having lower return, but, and you make a value judgment on how to do that. It's not weird. Read the web, question. I was able to actually go see my dad before he died. It was really something very important to me uh, to be able to do that and kids and I think that was a couple of months ago. I'm still doing this every three months, still getting that monoclonal antibody and I still have what they call full molecular uh, zero uh, cancer. It's not zero. You can't detect zero. All you can say is it's below detection. So for the moment, unless it mutates, and it no longer will work, which could always happen, I'm here. And remember what I said about climate. You've got slots you'd rather not have and slots you absolutely don't want. Well, I'd sure rather have the ones I'd rather not have but that aren't so bad, fatter, and the ones that are really bad, skinnier. So in almost any kind of problem, what you do with decision analysis is you work to try to get the better outcomes a larger probability, so you lower your risk, and the poorer outcomes, a lower one. That's what we did in the cancer treatments, what I try to do in climate, and why I think they're actually quite related. And we have some time to Q&A. I raced, sorry, I knew I had to do a lot, but okay. <laughs> so I had to talk at you so fast, but uh, I wanted people to get to see that it isn't just these two problems. We have to apply this in many, many kinds of decisions. Please, somebody must have comment or question. Please. How often do you do PCR considering the exponential? The week before I do the, um, the, um, the infusion. Because if I did it the week after, all it would tell me is it took it out that week. The See, what we're trying to do is figure out what's the right length. I want to have the absolute minimum number of treatments for two reasons. What do you want extra drug for and what do you want to spend their money for? It's an expensive drug. We came up with the three month frequency by a direct test. We waited once and it came back in about four and a half months. So then we said, okay, we'll be one month precautionary. But the truth is if I'm on a trip and I'm going and I'm in an IPCC meeting and I end up doing it three months and three weeks, I'm not very anal about it. I'm not worried. I know I'm going to be okay. I wouldn't do it five and a half months because you don't want to get solid lumps back. So the, here's another advantage of individualizing by doing the direct test. So now people have been, been trying to copy this three month thing and I keep telling them, why are you doing that? Why don't you take that into, here's where N of one main means nothing. I'm an N of one for four and a half months. Well, maybe if one of you had my cancer, you'd get away with six and a half months you don't need as much drug, or maybe only two and a half months. So that's where you could actually save money or be more efficacious by trying to do some kind, because the test, the, the PCR test is not that expensive, $5,000. Relative to a bone marrow transplant, $350,000 is pretty cheap. So I tried to convince them they're actually saving themselves money by keeping me out of the hospital for three weeks in the clean room and keeping me in the hospital for three hours for a $5,000 drug. So, um, and they've bought that. And even the insurance company has bought that. So uh, I'm now much cheaper than having had a second bone marrow transplant. So that's where, it's a great question, because those lengths of time, we can try to do it if you've got a diagnostic, and they did. Other? Sir? Um, you say similar 
to what you're saying about the insurance companies, I'm interested if you had to use some of the DA logic with the insurance people to get them past some of their paradigm, their paradigm, paradigmatic thinking. Yeah. yeah. I would think insurance companies would be one of the best at decision analysis. I talk to a lot of insurance companies, and if you had to rank corporations from those that kind of worry about global warming to those who worry about global warming solutions, right? The ones near the top who worry about the actual warming tend to be insurance companies right there near the top. The ones who worry about fixing the problem, that's fossil fuel industry because they don't want to charge higher prices. So it, 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 um, I generally find that they're pretty open-minded and very, very Bayesian when it comes to trying to accept uh, things like uh, climate issues. But when it comes to insurance and health, it's really quite a battle. I have talked to, um, when I, I talk to uh, a lot of medical groups, mostly not doctors, mostly managers, and they're insurance company people. And at first they start out, oh yeah, but this is an expensive drug and all that. It doesn't, and I said, okay, let's go through the logic. How much did it cost me to do my diagnostics? $5,000, right? If I didn't do the diagnostic and we ran a two-month thing, that's going to be two extra treatments a year. It's going to cost you ten dollars or $20,000. Don't you think it's better to spend the five and see and not overdrug the patient causing some side effect that's going to cost you? I mean, don't be penny-wise and pound foolish. You get some of these bean counters in there, and all they see is do it the way we're always doing it. That's not necessarily cost effective. What you want to do is you want to unpack all the option space and then take a look in the option space both at the health components and money matters too. And I don't see anything contradictory in figuring out how much it costs. Remember the difference between efficiency, right? You're weighing costs and benefits in some metric where, you know, how do you benefit? How do you try to put into dollars health benefits? Very difficult. And cost effectiveness means you've got a target, keep the guy alive, and you want to get there cheapest. Well, the insurance companies, every one of them should be doing cost effectiveness. And the smarter ones are. But they get stuck in these things. Uh, for example, most insurance companies would love not to insure people who live in the outer banks of North Carolina where their houses are going to get wiped out again by the next hurricane. Why are they insured? because it's the old boys in the legislature are requiring it by law. So what have they done? They've created what the social scientists call a moral hazard. What they do is they end up insisting that that house be insured. So the insurance company has to insure them. They don't let them by law have super high premiums. So that means every one of you who doesn't live in the Outer Banks of North Carolina or in some risky thing is paying slightly higher premium because those guys are getting a free subsidy. And that's where I'm starting to think insurance has to go national and not state. But then you start fighting states' rights. It, so you, it happens in government, also happens in companies. But I found the insurance companies, at least on climate, have been very open-minded, but they've been a lot more closed on health. Maybe you can tell me why. It's because they do it all the time. Climate's a dread, out there threat. So they open the brain up. Whereas, well, we've, we've got these frequency data. And they bring in the people into the company who are so used to frequency data that just do everything's frequency data. And I keep trying to tell them, it's not just. Both. Come on. Hire decision analysts. You guys can afford it. You're the best there is at this. So we have had this conversation. And some listen. Anybody else? Anybody yeah, it's one, one, uh, one last one in the back. You should give this side. Yeah, go for it. How hard it was to be objective and rational when you were um, dealing with something so personal as, uh, as cancer? Well, it was, I, in the book I tell a story about how the very first day when we met Sandra Horning, and I'm using, I'm, I'm in my left brain. I'm a very left brain person, as you probably can figure out. And I said, Sandra, I don't, you're not going to hold anything back. Tell us absolutely everything. And, and Terry's there, and she's sitting with a pad of paper. And Sandra said, you really want me to tell you everything? You know, because they do have data that people who know too much about why, 
they have almost no chance or in trouble. She said, you guys are going to read the web, aren't you? And we said, yeah. She said, don't believe the web. It doesn't have the latest treatments. And I said, so you're going to tell me this is really bad, aren't you? <laughs> and she said, just wait and listen. And she started talking, and I'm listening carefully. I don't think she was one minute into it, and I couldn't hear her. Have any of you ever seen Saving Private Ryan, the movie? Remember that scene where they land in Omaha Beach, and all of a sudden, motion happens at one quarter speed? I had never in then, my 56 years in life, had one experience like that. And all of a sudden, I wasn't hearing what she was saying. She was talking. There were words. And I said, no, I have to hear every word. I can't not hear everything. And, and, and so my left brain is fighting my right brain, exactly your question. And then I look down, and there's Terry taking notes at high speed. And I said, you know what? She'll get it. And about two minutes later, I kick back into being me, and I could have my conversation. So I am sympathetic to people. There's only, you know, you know I'm telling tell you, you're, you know, here I am, this healthy guy out there, feisty as hell. You could be dead pretty soon. You know, that's not an easy thing to hear just out of the blue. It came out of nowhere. So have an advocate. Have somebody who you can trust. Have somebody there. Hopefully none of you are going to ever need this. But you have parents and aunts and uncles and grandparents. And one day one of you may end up being their advocate because you're analytically trained and you may be the only one who can do it. I tell people if your niece is, is, is well-trained in computers and understands statistics, if she can stomach it, take her along. You need somebody there who can listen and hear what's said because it's so hard to do that. And you cannot blame yourself if you, you know, if you go through the private Ryan. That, who was it? It was, not the, it was the other guy. The, that kind of an out-of-body experience. And it's not rare. And there's no single one-size-fits-all. But everybody needs somebody there to help them if it's possible so that they don't go through that that I went through, even if it only happened to me once in my life. And for three minutes was one of the most important three minutes in my lives. And I didn't lose anything because Terry got it all down. Thank you, very Thank much. you all. Thank you very much, Professor Schmeier. You've Thank given you. us a lot of food for thought in, a, in, in just about an hour. Uh, and it's a pleasure to see two great uses of what we try to teach in our classes in climate and also in your person. That's and hard. you need these skills as citizens because so much of what you're going to hear out here from all the spin doctors and all the claims from all the people with painless dentistry and bargain antiques and, you know, and, uh, and, when, and, and, and of these other titles, you know, Clear Skies Initiatives. If it's in the title, it's usually because it ain't so. You have to learn how to deconstruct bad arguments. Who's talking in myth-busting and truth-telling, and who's talking in ranges and probability functions and apologizing? The latter folks are much more likely to be giving it to you straight than the ones who are so cocksure of the answer, especially on complex issues. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you.